Good morning. Welcome to the bridge. Um, we're so excited to have you here this morning and to see your faces. Um, before we begin today, uh, we're going to show a brief video. And uh, this is something that uh, I'm not going to intro very long. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But um, one of the things that I'm so excited about at the bridge is what God is doing among the women of the bridge. And he's working among the men, too. Right now, my heart is, is gripped by what he's doing among the women of the bridge. And so we're going to have a really unique opportunity coming up um, in April. But before we, we share the dates with you, here's a quick video explaining what that is. This year, we're going to look at the book of Acts, and we're going to dream together about what it looks like to get back to the simple, old, awesome things that the apostles did in the early church. Everything in our world right now feels a little chaotic, and something about the early church, the way that they served each other, the power of God through the Holy Spirit that was on their lives, it was anything but complicated. It was simple and pure. And I'm afraid we've become a generation that performs and, and does big acts of faith, but we don't do quiet acts of faith that nobody sees. That's my dream for us, that we would get really good at the things that nobody sees. So we're gonna go see one of the most powerful generations on earth in the way that God and power moved through them right after Jesus ascended, the apostles, and the beginning of the church. Join us, come be a part. So, ladies of the bridge, mark your calendars, save the dates April 28th and 29th. We're going to begin sending you announcements about this via email. Um, we're going to begin having kind of meetings about this and what that's going to look like. Our heart is that God would use, it's a Friday night and a Saturday. Um, there are going to be about 100 of us here, hopefully. Um, we're going to pray together. We're going to worship together. We're going to listen to teaching together. We're going to discuss it around tables, um, get to know one another, and then hopefully God will just unleash us on this city to be a light for him um, in the darkness. So I am really excited about it. There's more to come, and if you have questions, feel free to see me um, after the service or in the upcoming weeks. All right, we're going to worship together this morning. Before we do, um, go ahead and stand, and if you would greet the person next to you, ask them how they are, tell them you're glad to see them, and then we'll sing together. All right, if you'll go ahead and make it back to your seats. Psalm 121, 1 and 2 says, I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. We're going to sing this um, to God Almighty this morning. Join us. My foes are many. They rise against me, but I will hold my ground. I will not fear the war. I will not fear the storm. My help is on the way. My help is on the way. And oh my God, he will not delay my refuge and strength always I will not fear his promise is true my God will come through always always trouble surrounds me chaos abounding my soul will is on the way. And oh my God, he will not delay my refuge and strength always. I will not fear, his promise is true. 
In Ezekiel 37, when God's given Ezekiel this vision of the valley of the dry bones, he says in, in, in 37, 5 and 6, Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And so we're going to sing a song together, and the chorus says, It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. And this is basically just us giving back to the Lord what is His. Right? He's given us the breath that's within us. He's given us our lives. He's given given us everything that we have. So this is us just acknowledging that and giving it back to Him. Sing this with us. give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken, and great are you, Lord. Sing that again. You give life.
out your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. Your great Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. this time, if you are, uh, if you, I shouldn't say if you are a child, but that is true. If you have a child who is newborn through fifth grade, um, or if you are a child that's newborn through fifth grade, go ahead and walk out those back doors and to the left, um, and they're going to head off to Children's Church. If this is your first time at the bridge, um, there will be people out there that can show you exactly where to go. Um, so go ahead and, and head out those back doors. We're going to continue in worship um, with amazing grace, but before we do, we're going to pray for those kids as they head out and um, just pray for the rest of our time in worship together. So join us as we pray. Abba, Father, we just thank you for this morning, God. We thank you that, Father, all of this is yours, that we are yours. Um, Father, we thank you for uh, just the many, many uh, children that you've that you've given us here at the bridge father and I pray that this morning as they head back to their classes Lord that you would just give them expectant hearts and open hearts um, Lord that they would learn uh, straight from you father that they would hear straight from you this morning about why you created them about how you want to redeem them to yourself um, father and we just pray the same for us Lord I pray that uh, that we would have open hearts this morning Lord as we sing how amazing your grace is. God, may that be true for us this morning. Um, Father, may we genuinely be able to sing, my chains are gone. Father, that I've been set free. Father, we ask humbly that you would show us what your freedom really means this morning. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen.
us to sing that chorus together one more time just without instruments just voices only my chains are gone my chains are gone i've been set free my god my Abba, Father, Lord, we all come to you today with humble hearts, Lord, some with heavy hearts, some with confused hearts, some of us joyous hearts, Lord. Uh, your mercy that rains down on us constantly, Lord, we just can't thank you enough for that that wonderful mercy that you just pour out over us. Lord, we thank you for your un unfailing love. A love that's so, so big, so deep that we can't even understand it or even explain it to anybody. But we know it's there. We thank you for that. Lord, we know uh, you know our hearts. And we ask you just to Open our hearts today, Lord. Just, just turn them to where our, our hearts are for you. Help us to hear you, to understand you, to know you and love you more deeply. And as we hear your word, Lord, may we hear your soft whisper. Lord, we pray for Stephen today. Lord, we just... You hide him behind your cross. Give him a voice today. That's your voice, not of his. It's your voice. And Lord, as we, uh, as we sit here, Lord, we just invite your Holy Spirit just to flood into this place, into our hearts. That when we leave here, we leave here changed because of your son Jesus and knowing that he changed us. We thank you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you today, we're going to be in Joshua chapter 5.
And I don't remember exactly when it was that I learned about this feature on a remote control, but you can push the pause button on a remote control. And once I discovered that you had the ability to push the pause button, it became rather entertaining for me to figure out how to push the pause button to capture an actor or actress's face in some kind of very unique, strange mode. You can also push the fast forward button and the rewind button. But I thought about those buttons as we approach Joshua chapter 5, and I think that it is safe to say that we live in a fast forward culture, a fast forward world. A world that constantly is telling you and I, it's got to be faster, it's got to be quicker, you don't have time to slow down, you don't have time to pause, you don't have time to rewind. Interestingly, God has a different perspective. In fact, God's perspective is, time doesn't limit me. I have all the time in the world. And when you and I tend to think, I don't have enough time, I've got to run, 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 we forget who holds the world in his hands. If you remember from last week, the people of Israel have crossed the Jordan River, and Joshua 5.1 basically tells us that the people have heard about the Jordan River being crossed, and it says that their hearts melted and there was no longer any spirit in them. Which many would say, this is the exact time to carpe diem, seize the day, go after them, attack. And God has a different plan. God pushes the pause button on his people. God hasn't changed much. God cares much more about our character than our career. God cares much more about what he's doing on the inside of you and I than any kind of external facade that we may want to put forward. So here's the good news. If you're anything like me, it's kind of hard to fake it. Okay, that expression, fake it till you make it, just wears me out. And I don't make it. I'm not good at faking it. But our culture will say, oh, you've got to look a certain way, you've got to do a certain thing. And God says, I care about what's going on here. And I am going to be at work here. And if that means that things are going to be a little messy, a little bumpy, Externally, I would rather be doing inner heart work in you than to have my son one day point to you and say, you look like a whitewashed tomb that is pretty on the inside. Sorry, on the outside, but on the inside, you're just bones, just wasting away. So God pushes pause on his people. And he tells Joshua, to make flint knives and circumcise every man in the camp. Here we go. This is God's reading to us today, Joshua chapter 5, beginning with verse 2. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at Gibeath Haraloth. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the males of the people who came out of Egypt, all the men of war, had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. Though all the people who came out had been circumcised, yet all the people who were born on the way in the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the people of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation, the men of war who came out of Egypt, perished because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. The Lord swore to them that he would not let them see the land that the Lord had sworn to their fathers to give us. 
a land flowing with milk and honey. So it was their children whom he raised up in their place that Joshua was circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. When the circumcising of the whole nation was finished, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. And so the name of that place is called Gilgal to this day. While the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month in the evening on the plains of Jericho. And the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. And the manna ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the land. And there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would fill us with your spirit, that you'd give us your ears, your eyes, your heart. You'd activate our feet, our hands, so that we would know you, so that we would trust you, so that we would do your will and walk with you. May you hide me behind your cross. God, speak to us today. We need you, and we're thirsty, Father, to hear from you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you are a parent, you have made a mistake before in raising your children. And we know that, don't we? We know all too well that there are those moments that come where we just totally say something or do something that if we could push the rewind button, we would. And we would do it over again. So Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, God says that you need to be careful to obey everything in this law. But the people of Israel, who did not believe that God was bigger than giants to take the promised land, didn't believe and did not circumcise their children. Now, some people look at this and go, circumcision... Okay, our children's ministry people, they saw this chapter come in a few weeks ahead of time, and they're like, circumcision, what do we do? Oh God, please don't let me have that week. <laughs> Pray for our children's ministry people right now. Because a fourth of them are there faithfully teaching our kids right now. What is all this about, all this circumcision? Well, it's a sign. It's a sign of a promise. It's a sign of a covenant. What is being married without a wedding ring? Now, does this wedding ring make me married? No, it doesn't make me married. But it is a reminder that I am married. It is the truth of some promise, of some covenant that happened, that took place between me and my wife. So God, when he talks to Abram in Genesis chapter 17, says, I am making a covenant, a promise with you. And the sign of this promise is that I'm going to circumcise, you're going to be circumcised, but not only you, but every single one of your children and your children's children and everyone who will come in. There's some interesting verses in scripture as Jamie talked about refugees. That God in his inclusiveness has said, anyone that's willing to come into your camp 
and to learn about the one true God, you circumcise and you teach about the one true God. That Israel, though it started with Israel as God's chosen people, Abram was blessed so that through him and by him and his seed with a capital S, all nations, all peoples would be blessed. But now you have everyone in this camp. They, they wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years. And anyone that was 20 or 19 and younger was not circumcised. They don't have the sign. They don't have the ring on their finger. And you know what else they know? And it's, it's a sad thing, but sometimes children suffer because of parents' mistakes. They do. And the whole time as they're wandering around in this wilderness, these kids are looking and going, this wasn't according to the law, which is written down now, to, that can be referred to. This wasn't God's original plan. We're supposed to be in this land that's flowing with milk and honey, but our parents, our parents didn't believe. And then maybe they go to Genesis chapter 17 where God talks about circumcision. And if you look at Genesis 17 verse 14, it says this, any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And here you have hundreds of thousands of people wandering in the wilderness that know this verse and see this and go, I'm not circumcised. Am I, I'm cut off. Am I one of God's people? Well, God's been faithful to them. Manna, quail, fire by night, cloud by day, taking care of his people to prove that even when we are faithless, he will remain faithful because he cannot deny himself. But they got to be wondering, am I really one of God's people? I don't have this sign but God just parted the Jordan River and now if you notice in chapter 5 verse 2 of Joshua it says at that time the Lord said to Joshua this was not Joshua's idea this was the Lord's idea and what the Lord is doing is those people who are wondering are they my people I'm going to make them my people now I'm going to give them the ring of the covenant. Now, most of us would probably prefer a ring like this as opposed to the circumcision as a sign of that covenant. This is crazy. Joshua, the commander of an army, is making flint knives and he's basically temporarily handicapping his army. They're going to be cut and it's going to hurt. Let's just focus on that one first. Circumcision is going to be painful. And we worship comfort here in good old America. This past week, and we succeeded last night, but this past week we have gone kitchen table shopping. I don't really like to shop for much of anything, but we shopped for a kitchen table. And on President's Day, you know, it's good sales, furniture, President's Day, something like that, we went to Rothman Furniture. Daria, Benny, Sophie, and Ava Walker, who is their cousin. And we sat on chairs while Daria looked for a table. And let me tell you about these chairs. There are chairs, if you don't know this yet, this is worth the trip to Rothman. There are chairs that are massage chairs at Rothman. And there are four of them. And Benny sat in the first one, and Ava in the second one, and Sophie in the third one, and I was in the fourth one. What I didn't realize, what I didn't complain about, is they improved down the line. I was in the best massage chair. Benny's chair, the battery wasn't working or it wasn't plugged in or something. 
So Ava and Sophie and I are very much enjoying ourselves. And Sophie, who loves our current dining room table because she just doesn't like change and she's very sentimental, says, Daddy, we don't need a table. We need a chair like this. And I'm being massaged by this chair. And I'm like, Sophie, you are absolutely right. We got to figure out how to get one of these chairs. And then Benny walks over, because remember, his massage chair isn't working, and looks at me and says, Daddy, can I have a turn? And I would love to tell you that I jumped out of that chair. But I said, as soon as this thing turns off, it can be your turn, Benny. And he's waiting. And Daria's shopping for tables. And Daria comes back and realizes that I have not given my massage chair to Benny yet. And says, Stephen, get up and give your son a turn. I'm like, I will when I'm done. And you know, spouses can just give eyes sometimes. And I got those eyes and I went, okay. I'm getting up now. I got up, and Benny enjoyed the chair. As soon as I got up, I checked the price. And we will not be getting one of those chairs. <laughs> the chair I sat in was almost $7,000. But here's how this story is not just a side note. There are people, apparently who are willing to spend close to $7,000 for a massage chair. And you think about all the other things in our culture that will capture comfort and ease. We will go to great lengths to be comfortable as a people. And what does God tell us He's moving us toward? He's moving us out of our comfort zone. He's telling us to step out in faith and to trust Him to catch us. He's telling us, don't look for comfort. Look for me. Because when you find me, though there may be some things that are uncomfortable, I am your strong tower. I am your refuge. I am your great reward. So much so, that James tells us in James 1, 5, consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials and difficulties of many kinds. That's like it requires a reprogramming of our mind to do that. But what if we as the people of God, when things do not go the way we want them to, instead of throwing a pity party, we go... Wait, my God is sovereign. He's in control. He knew about this situation. And he will only lead me to what will be my greatest good and something that will eventually be for his glory. That doesn't make it fun. It doesn't make it easy. It didn't make the knives hurt any less. But God is telling his people, you are mine and I want you to know you are mine. Trust me. Not only is it painful, but it makes us vulnerable. They can't march after this. They're sitting, they're waiting, they're exposed, they're weak. But remember Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, he said, there's this thorn in my side that I keep asking God, God, take it away, take it away, take it away. And finally, God said, Paul, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. What if we said, God, if you have to make me weak so that you're strong, I trust you. I trust you in that. It also requires decision. I have a group that I meet with every Tuesday morning, and we've called it the Sermon Prep Brainstorming Team meeting, and it is infinitely valuable to me. I try to take notes, and I listen to everything that everyone else says in that meeting. 
And one thing that someone said in that meeting is, if I saw Joshua coming with a knife, man, I would run for the hills. I'd just go to Jericho. I would go. What are they doing? They are willfully choosing to be under the knife of God. You know, Romans 12 too tells us that in view of God's mercy, we are called to be living, actually 12.1, living sacrifices. Someone said one time, the problem with a living sacrifice, it's still alive, which means when the altar gets tough, when it gets painful, when it gets hot, you can crawl off the altar. That God wants to refine us and do a work in our heart that causes us to say, Stephen, it's, it's going to be hot, it's going to be uncomfortable, but you've got to trust me. And why? Because there is this cancer in me, a spiritual cancer called sin. And God knows it'll destroy me. So God says, I want you to be purified. I want you to be helped. I want you to be strengthened. So trust me. And I'm going to cut away some stuff. I'm going to cut away selfishness. I'm going to cut away greed, pride, jealousy, anger. Fill in the blank of whatever it is. Can you trust me to do that? It doesn't say if Joshua circumcised everybody. If he did, boy, he was worn out at the end of this. But everyone, every male chose to be circumcised. Jamie talked about the fact that some of these people in this school have come to know Christ and chosen then to be baptized. You know, the New Testament parallel to circumcision is baptism. And we're weird here. We have a baptismal season because we have our baptistry outside and probably no one would want to be baptized today. It's a little chilly outside. It is heated. But what happens at baptism? Well, when Jesus was baptized, the skies opened and a voice came and said, this is my son whom I love with him. Him, I am well pleased. And when you and I step out and say, God's done a work in me and I want to be baptized, we hear a similar thing. This is my child whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. So these men are being circumcised. And then there's two other things I want to highlight In verse 8, by the way, our chapter today is one play but three acts, okay? Act 1 is circumcision, act 2 is Passover, and act 3 is the commander of the Lord's army. We're about to wrap up act 1. When the circumcising of the whole nation was finished, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. You just highlight this, until they were healed. How many of you have had a surgery and you've been given instructions on what you're supposed to do after the surgery and you have disobeyed the doctor's directions? Because after all, you got stuff you got to do. And how many of you, by doing too much after a surgery that you weren't supposed to do, ended up having to undergo a second surgery or at least have the healing time take longer? People say, until you are healed. Until you're healed. God's patient. He wants you to sit and wait. And you know what happens when you sit and wait? He's still working. Don't worry. He's got this and he's got you. But if you're going through something, there is a time to sit and be healed. And God wants you to sit and experience that. Not only that, in verse 9, it says, The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. What does it mean to roll reproach away? 
You know what they're doing the last 40 years? They're wandering around in the wilderness. And you know what all the other nations are watching? And by the way, this was a really small circle they're walking. All these other nations are looking at them and going, your God freed you from Egypt with these amazing things. And now you're just circling around. You're a laughing stock. You're just circling around. Who are you anyway? And God says, I'm rolling that away now. All the things that others are making fun of about you, you're going to know what else rolls away. Shame. Guilt. Anybody wrestle with those things? Erica talked a little bit about an IF conference that's going to happen on April 28th and 29th. It's going to sound kind of weird. I'm excited about it. I'm not going to get to go. (laughs) I'm not a woman. But I'm excited about it. And I think there's going to be some great things that are going to happen. The founder of IF wrote this in this book. And she's imagining, what would I do if I were your enemy? If I were your enemy, this is what I would do. Make you believe you need permission to lead. Make you believe you are helpless. Make you believe you are insignificant. Make you believe that God wants your decorum and behavior. So if I were your enemy, I would make you numb and distract you from God's story. Technology, social media, Netflix, travel, food and wine, comfort. I would not tempt you with notably bad things, or you would get suspicious. I would distract you with everyday comforts that slowly feed you a different story and make you forget God. Then you would dismiss the Spirit leading you, loving you, and comforting you. Then you would start to love comfort more than surrender. Remember that massage chair? And obedience and souls. If that didn't work, I would attack your identity. Absence of a sign of the covenant. I would make you believe that you had to prove yourself. Then you would focus on yourself instead of God. Friends would become enemies. Teammates would become competition. You would isolate yourself and think you are not enough. You would get depressed and be ungrateful for your story. Or you would compare and believe you are better than others. You would judge people who need God. You would condemn them rather than love and invite them in. You would gossip and destroy and tear down other works of God. Either way, you would lose your joy because your eyes would be fixed on yourself and people instead of on Jesus. And if that didn't work, I would intoxicate you with the mission of God rather than God himself. Then you would worship a cause instead of Jesus. You would fight each other to have the most important roles. You would burn out from striving. You would think that success is measured by the results you see. You would build platforms for applause rather than display God. Then all your time and effort would be spent on becoming important rather than on knowing Jesus and loving people. The goals would be to gather followers, earn fancy job titles, publish books, big, build big ministries, rather than to seek the souls of men and the glory of God. And if that didn't work, I would make you suffer. Then maybe you would think God is evil rather than good. Your faith would shrink. You would get bitter and weary and tired rather than flourish and grow and become more like Christ. You would try to control your life rather than step into the plans he has for you. How do we avoid this? We ask God to tell us who we are and whose we are. And he puts a ring on our finger and he tells us, you're my son, you're my daughter. There's nothing you need to prove because my son did it for you on the cross. What happens after they're completely healed? They experience Passover. Anybody remember Passover? The firstborn lamb 
is killed, and the blood from that lamb, an unblemished lamb, is painted on the door of the home, and when the angel of death comes, it's passed over your home. That we need this. But here's the other crazy thing, guys. This is only the third time God's people in over 40 years have actually observed Passover. They observed the first Passover when God freed them, and then they observed Passover at the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. And now for 40 years, for 38 years, they have not observed Passover. And now they're circumcised. And now they're ready to observe Passover and to remember this great work of God. God freed them from slavery with Passover, and God will bring them into the new land with Passover. It also says, on that day, the manna ceased. In our sermon prep brainstorming team meeting, Nick said that's the most important verse in this chapter. Now he was being, no, he's standing by it. Had a great observation about it. They finally get to eat something else. They've eaten manna for 40 years. You know what sin looks like? Sin looks like the most scrumptious, decadent meal you could ever eat. You put it in your mouth, and it becomes cardboard that turns to poison on the way down. What's the manna? It's bread from heaven, right? But what does it also represent? The people are wandering. They're stuck. They're spinning their tires. And now, after Passover, the manna ceases and they eat from the produce of the land flowing with milk and honey. God wants to give you good food, guys. And all too often, we will be attracted by the empty promises of sin instead of the tasty goodness of walking with God. What else does the manna ceasing represent? Their wilderness wandering is over. With these kids for 40 years, they were stuck. It's a new day. It can be a new day for you also. So they eat Passover meal. The manna stops. They're enjoying. They're completely healed. And I think they're kind of celebratory. Wait a second. Christians aren't supposed to do that, right? We're supposed to always be. If you're having too much fun, you must be sinning somehow. No, they're rejoicing. Because God has given them good blessings. But now, as we move into Act 3, Joshua goes for a walk. They're at Gilgal still. Joshua goes to Jericho. What's he doing? He's the commander of the Lord's army. So he thinks. And he's feeling the burden. And he's feeling the stress. And he's experiencing the loneliness of leadership. And he goes for a walk. He wants to see for himself what the two spies reported. He wants to see how the lay of the land changed in 40 years. Remember, he was one of those original 12 spies. And I think he's prayer walking. And I think possibly his prayer went something like this. God, I don't have what it takes. I mean, you've done amazing things, and I'm not going to say that you aren't still going to do amazing things, but do you see these walls, God? What am I going to do? The Bible says he looks up. And behold, a man was standing there with a drawn sword in his hand. Who is this man? Joshua goes to him and he asks a different question. He doesn't say, who are you? He says, are you for us or for our adversaries? Are you for us or against us? In other words, if you are against me, you might as well just Get it over with, because I have no chance standing against you. But if you're for us, woohoo, we got this made. And the commander of the Lord's army says, 
no. And no. Because our struggle in this world is not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is against spiritual forces of darkness. And our culture and our country right now is so divided with us against them on nearly every single front that I think God wants to speak a resounding no. Your enemy is not another human being that's been created in God's image. Your enemy is the devil and his demons that have duped you guys into being against one another. And until you wake up and smell that coffee, you think you're going to rally me to your side? That somehow God likes one political party more than the other? That somehow God likes one denomination more than the other? That somehow God likes one country more than the other? Are you kidding me? He's going to say, no. I came for all. My desire is to redeem all. So if you think you got God on your side based on your preferences, I just say no to that. But if that's not your game, and it wasn't Joshua's game, I think Joshua asked the question just because he was wondering, do I need to like say my final words and make my final peace with God? If that's not your game, then the commander of the Lord's army, the true commander of the Lord's army says, I am here. I am here, Joshua. You're worried about those walls, but I am here. And those walls, they worry you, but they do not worry me. And I am here. And that needs to be the thing that stabilizes you. Are you looking at the mountain or are you looking at the one that moves mountains? I am here. What happened after Joshua heard that? The only thing that can happen when you have that kind of encounter, he falls to his face and he worships. This is a holy, reverent moment for Joshua. And what's amazing is, and this is how you know whether you're really worshiping, okay? Now, I love expression, okay? You all hear this all the time. I am convinced impression without expression leads to depression. And I love it when we're singing and people are raising their hands to heaven. It's a form of expression. But that doesn't guarantee that you're worshiping. Because you can do all of this and your heart not be surrendered to God. The evidence that you are truly worshiping is what Joshua says after he falls on his face and worships. He asks, what does my Lord say to his servant? In other words, what he is asking is whatever, God, whatever, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. Wherever you want me to go, I'll go. Whatever it costs to me, that's what I'm doing. That's worship. It is a heart and life completely surrendered to God. That's worship. Are you always worshiping? Probably not. Am I always worshiping? Definitely not. Is God always gracious? Absolutely. Will God come? Yes. Will God get you to where you need to be? Definitely. He will. And sometimes he says, Stephen, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. (laughs) I'm going to get you there. You can choose which way. But he'll get us there. Who is this commander of the Lord's army? It's described here as a man. Some people think it's an angel. But get this. Joshua falls face down and worships. And this man slash angel does not tell Joshua, get up. Every angel of God will tell someone 
stand up. Don't you worship me, you worship God. And to receive worship, an angel receiving worship is an act of treason on the part of the angel. And this, the commander of the Lord's army, receives the worship of Joshua. Who is this? This is the true commander of the Lord's army. Joshua thought he was the commander of the Lord's army. Sometimes I think I am the shepherd of this church, but I am not. Jesus Christ does. He is the chief shepherd of the sheep, this church and every church that bears his name. Now that's a gut check, but it's a good gut check. And you know what that gut check does? That gut check goes, oh good, thank you God. Because I don't know where green pastures are. I don't know where still waters are. I don't know where that righteous path is. I don't know how to be with someone through the valley of the shadow of death. I don't know how to prepare a table in the presence of enemies. I don't know how to anoint someone's head with oil and to cause their cup to runneth over. I don't know how surely and goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I don't know how to do that. And I don't know how someone could dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But that's not my job. That's the chief shepherd's job. And he does it every day and every way. Who is this commander of the Lord's army? This commander of the Lord's army is the second person of the Trinity. This commander of the Lord's army, remember, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, they're all three in one, and they all were there at the beginning of the world. A lot of people think Jesus came into being at Christmas time when he was born a baby, but he was not. That's when he took on flesh and became one of us. He was there at the very beginning. And what? You read the Old Testament closely, Jesus shows up all over the place. Anyone who who may have told you, or any book that you maybe read at some point that said that the Old Testament just kind of prepares the way for the New Testament, uh, no, we don't believe that at the bridge. (laughs) We believe that the theme of covenantal graciousness and love and goodness of God is there from Jot and tittle, number one, to jot and tittle, the end, okay? And that Jesus shows up. You see, Jesus came as a messenger to Abram to tell Abram, Sarah's going to have a son. Jesus came to Jacob and wrestled with him. Jesus, when Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were in the fiery furnace, and then all of a sudden there's a fourth person in that fire with them. And Jesus came. And what does Jesus in pre-incarnate form tell Joshua to do after he worships? Take off your sandals. Where you stand is holy ground. Huh. Wait a second. Wasn't Moses? Didn't, didn't the burning bush tell Moses? Oh, sorry, that wasn't the burning bush. That also was the pre-incarnate second person of the Trinity in the form of a burning bush told Moses, take off your sandals where you stand is holy ground. And Joshua being Moses' aide probably had to hear that story over a thousand times over 40 years. Moses never got over his encounter with the burning bush. And when Joshua hears The commander of the Lord's army say, take off your sandals. Where you stand is holy ground. Joshua goes, this is my moment. This is my time now. And he takes off his sandals. And he worships. Notice also, the commander of the Lord's army does not tell Joshua, rally the troops. Take Jericho. Because that's not the Christian's work. The Christian's work is to worship. 
our work is our worship. And from a posture of worship, God calls us to do work for him. Are you overwhelmed? Are you stressed? Are you wondering, who am I? Joshua 5 applies because Joshua experienced God say, I'm going to give my people a sign so they know that they're mine. I'm going to give my people a meal so that they know that it wasn't their works that got them out of slavery and bondage. It was my great work. And when they're in over their heads and they have no idea what to do, I'm going to come to them. And I'm going to let them know, I am here. We don't rally God to our agenda, but God, through the miracle of his grace, will move in our hearts to cause us to rally to his agenda. And when that happens, it's beautiful. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would give us grace to know that you are on your throne, that you are here, that you are near, that you are in control, and you're good, and that we need you. But that when we declare that we need you, you're here. So God, may you do a work in your people now, showing us where green pastures and still waters are. Lord, I pray that your word, which you promise will never return void, but always accomplish its purpose, may grip our hearts, and that we may worship you today in spirit and in truth. So we continue in this worship service. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So sometimes as Stephen is preaching, um, as the Holy Spirit is moving, we call an audible and change the song that we're going to sing afterward. (laughs) Um, Because Stephen mentioned that uh, impression without expression leads to depression. And um, for, for me and for Matt, as we were sitting there, the expression following that truth was, Lord, I need you, right? Um, because no matter how much we strive, no matter how much we work, um, th- our work is worship. And so we can just express our need for the Lord. Um, so we're actually gonna, we're gonna switch it up a little bit um, and we're gonna sing, <laughs> good, we don't have the music for it. So we're gonna sing it acapella actually, um, <laughs> if that's all right. Cause we may feel, I think feel that strongly um, about it. It doesn't seem to be in the L's. Good, it's great. Um, so go ahead and stand and we are, we're gonna, we're gonna sing this song together. We're gonna sing it acapella because this is a song that I know we know well. Um, and I feel pretty, pretty strongly that the Spirit's leading us to do this, so we're just going to do it. Hope that's all right, Stephen. <laughs> all right. Great. You have it? Never mind. Andrew has it. Perfect. Huh? Oh. That's all right. We'll just sing acapella. All right. Here we go. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense and my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found, 
is where you are and where you are lord i am free holiness is christ in me lord i need you some declaration uh, with an acknowledgement that all glory be to Christ. In Psalm 46, it, it says, be still and know that I am God, right? Stop striving, stop, stop working, just be still, just know, which is exactly what the Israelites did before God instructed them to walk around Jericho. So now we're just going to declare and we're going to sing together, all glory be to Christ. Should nothing of our efforts stand, no legacy survive, unless the Lord does raise the house in vain, its builders strive, and to you who boast tomorrow's gain, tell me what is your life.
Amen. Just a quick thing, if you want to talk to Jamie Rogers, she's going to be kind of at a table in the foyer area, and I'll show her where that's supposed to be because I forgot to do it earlier. But uh, I want us to reflect on two things as we leave today. God knew that his people needed to know who they were before he sent them out. And God knew that his people needed to worship before they were sent out. And then we're going to find out next week in Joshua 6 that when they're sent out, they're just called to walk. Just walk around these walls. And God says, I'll I'll cause them to fall down. So we worshiped today here as we gathered for that reminder and that refresher so that you would know who you are in Christ and worshiped. And now you're getting sent out to walk. To walk in that. Walk in the way of who you are and worship in that. It's not your job to knock the walls down. That's God's. But He will be faithful to do it. You worship, you walk, and you watch Him work. And He will get all the glory. Because the world will look and see and go, ain't no way this could have been done apart from God. Let's receive this benediction. All glory to your Son, Jesus. All glory to you, Jesus. Jesus, thank you for showing up in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and in our lives by the Holy Spirit. Until that great day when you come on the clouds and you call your own to us. Empower and equip us and enable us to walk with you and watch you knock down the walls of sin and selfishness and strife. May your kingdom come in our community on earth as it is in heaven. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. May you go with God.